Well, I believe you're ready to go tonight. If you're, if you're ready to go, God's ready to come. So we ought to meet somewhere right in the middle, haven't we? God, we just thank you for this opportunity and this privilege. You're an awesome God, and we love you, and we thank you for today. We thank you for giving us another day and another opportunity. God, we got to remember this could be our last time together, so we got to make the best of it. You've given it to us, and if you've given it to us, it's supposed to be glorious and grand, and we just thank you for that, and we love you. And God, we're going to give you our best now. So just bless everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Amen, I know you are. I'm going to speak, I'm going to sing. We're going to sing, I will bless thee, O Lord. <laughs> Bless thee, O Lord. I will bless thee, O Lord. With a heart full of saving, I will bless thee, O Lord. With my hands lifted up, and my heart filled with praise. With a heart of thanksgiving, I will bless thee, O Lord. over a hilltop.
we're going to sing an oldie, a goodie, but we've ramped it up a little bit. Uh-oh. Okay? <laughs> I'm trying to take some of these more mature songs <laughs> and, and modernize them just a little bit more <laughs> for our generation right here, right? We got, we got a piece all, so I think you'll like it. Spring up, oh well. <laughs> Father, we thank you for that well of living water that you promised for all of your children, and it never, ever stopped flowing. We thank you for your goodness, for your spirit, God, that ministers to us and ministers through us. And God, all the wisdom and knowledge that you feed into us, all of these are part of that well. And we just pray, God, that tonight we'll just take our umbrellas down and God just let you pour into us everything you want to. Let us understand it and let us resolve ourselves to be more like you in everything we do. We lift up all of our sick and all of our hurting and ask you, God, tonight to minister to them. Meet every need that's on our prayer list and prayer chain. And here in this building, God, and those who are watching, I pray for you to touch every single person, no matter whether they're sad, downtrodden, sick, hurting, no matter what it may be, that, God, you minister and that this be a good night and we all praise you and glorify you for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will do in Jesus'
this name we pray, amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I guess you're not going, you're, you're not going to be, so go ahead. You know, I, you know, I told you Sunday night, we need to be encouragers. Amen. Have you been encouragers this week? Amen. Well, I'm going to give you a chance to be encourager. I want you to say this with me. Mary, Mary we, believe we believe you saw that cloud. You saw that cloud. Now then. No, no, let that cat alone. If he's lost, that's where he needs to be. All right. Oh, okay. okay. Gwen? Oh, you got a cat. Okay, there's your cat if you want one. All right. Amen. to share with us tonight so y'all listen close as she talks so you can hear she didn't want one
Amen. <clears throat> Amen. It says that Facebook has never made the lame to walk, but it makes the dumb to speak. <laughs> I could, Lord, I couldn't have said that any better myself. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Maria, thank you for sharing from your heart. And it was heartfelt, and we appreciate it. And uh, thank God for his goodness and God for his grace and mercy <clears throat> that helps us to, to go forward in everything that we do in faith, believing that God is going to be with us and help us and direct us in all these things. Now, I want you to open your Bible to the book of Nehemiah. <clears throat> See if you can find that one. <clears throat> Ezra, Nehemiah, Job, Esther, Psalms, Proverbs. We've got a <clears throat> we've got a good crowd here at church tonight, and I appreciate this. You, you look good, and I'm, I'm glad you're in God's house. Glad you want to be here, and glad you are here. And God will reward you for being here. I promise you that. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 6. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 6. We'll begin by looking at one verse, verse 3. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you're going to share. Thank you for what we're going to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Tonight, as we are going to look at these words and try to understand what Nehemiah is saying. We need to back up a little bit and tell you a little bit. Nehemiah was just a, a regular guy that was taken into captivity when, Babylonian, when the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem and tore the city up, took them away for 70 years in bondage as God had said that was going to happen. And as this story picks up, Prior to this, a group of people had left Babylon and gone back to Jerusalem. And when they got back to Jerusalem, they decided that they were going to rebuild the temple. So they rebuilt the temple in a way. Now, this is not Solomon's temple. This is just the temple there. They rebuilt it, and they were able to go there and worship in the temple. <clears throat> but that's all they did, just the temple and their houses. So this goes on for a good while. And then one day, 
some of the those who had gone and rebuilt the temple, they come back to Persia where Nebuchadnezzar is still there. And Nebuchadnezzar meets them and he says to them, tell me, how are things in Jerusalem? And his brother is one of the ones that has come back to deliver the message. And they said things are really bad. He said, we have the temple and people have houses, but the walls have not been rebuilt. And we go to over in chapter 1, <clears throat> chapter 1, Nehemiah says that when he heard this, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. And the walls of Jerusalem also are broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I, Nebuchadnezzar, when I Nehemiah, heard these things, that he sat down and he wept. So they say, listen, the walls have not been rebuilt. The gates are not up. So that meant that anybody, enemy or friend, whatever, anybody could come into the city and do anything they wanted to because every city back then that was a city had a wall built around to keep people out for their protection. So Nehemiah now finds out the walls are not rebuilt. <clears throat> and we could think, you know, that's no big deal not to have walls, but it was to him. He was very concerned. Some, in fact, so much so that it broke his heart. And he began to weep and began to mourn because the wall had not been rebuilt. So at this time, Nehemiah is what they called a cupbearer for the king there in Persia. And his job was to test anything that the king would drink. He would drink it first and make sure there was no poison in it. So he was willing to give his life for the king. He had a great relationship with him. And it's not like he's still in bondage. He's part of the kingdom there. And um, it said that even uh, at that time Esther would have been there. And that Esther perhaps helped him to get this particular job that he had. So he's, he's a cupbearer for a king. Has a great relationship. Has a good thing going on. But when he hears the walls are still torn down. It breaks his heart. And he looks back on what used to be and realizes that it is no more, but it could be. So he begins to pray and he begins to seek God. He begins to fast. And I want you to listen to his prayers for a moment. This is what he prayed to God. He says, Lord, let your ear be attentive and let your eyes be open that you may hear the prayers of your servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night. For the children of Israel, thy servants, and I confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. So he's trying to seek God's will about these walls. He wants to go back, but he wants God's will because he knows he's going to need God's help. So he prays and he says, Father, I want you to forgive the people and I want you to forgive me and my house because we have sinned. They would not have been in bondage had they not rejected God. So he, what he's saying, they were certainly in sin and they certainly had a bad problem. So he's asking God to forgive. And he says, we have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept your commandments, nor the statutes, nor your judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses, that we should keep. He's about to partake on a great journey and a great job. But he realizes that he needs God and he needs God's help. So the first thing he does is he prays and he asked God to forgive him of his sins. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because it's going to be very important when we get to the end of this. After he does that, then he prays some more, and then he gets up, and he begins to formulate a plan about going back and building the walls. So the first thing that he has to do is that he has to go in to the king and ask the king 
to allow him to go back because he has a job. And the king likes him. He likes the king. There's no problem. But he wants to go home and build the wall. So he goes into the king. And for several days, he had been praying. In fact, four months. Four months take place from the first prayer to the time that he leaves. There's a, there's a four-month interval in there that he's praying and seeking God's will. Near the end of these four months... The king notices that he's not right. There's something wrong about him. And he makes up his mind, I'm going into the king today and ask the king, can I go? Now, four months have elapsed. So he goes into the king. And the king speaks first and he says, Nehemiah, what what is the matter? He says, I've noticed you lately and you look down, you look discouraged. You've got a sadness in your countenance. You're not happy. What's going on? And Nehemiah says to him, King I want to go back home and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Again, think about it. What what makes building the wall so important to him? Think of what the king must have thought. You want to go back and build some walls. Just think about that. So as he begins to go to the king, it says, And then the king said to me, For what thou, what, what is this request that you want? So he said, So I prayed again to God in heaven, and I asked again for God to help me. And he told the king, and the king said to him, Okay, if this is really what you want, I'll let you go. So Nehemiah gets brave. And he says, King, will you give me a letter that I can carry with me that says I have your permission to go and do what I'm about to do? Because I know that people are going to call me out because here I have been a slave and they're going to cause problems. Can I have a letter? He said, no problem. I'll I'll give you a letter and I'll also give you whatever you need to do, whatever you got to do. Don't worry about it. So here's a man that doesn't know if he's going to get to do it or how he's going to do it. Yet when he begins to pray, and he fasted and prayed for a four-month period in there, there was fasting and praying going on, not the whole time, but there was fasting and praying until he got clearance from God. Then he went to the king and got permission of the king, and God prepared the king and said, King, He says, I want you to make sure that you let him have everything that he wants. God can use bad people to do good things. Don't ever forget that. So he goes back to Jerusalem with the sole purpose of rebuilding the walls. When he gets there, he looks around and he sees that the people have built a temple and they have houses to go in. But they stopped, and that was all they did. So Nehemiah calls them out. Now think about this. This is, this is just a regular man who was a cupbearer for a king coming back to Jerusalem to a group of people that he hasn't seen in ages. And we don't really know how many there were. And he's supposed to get them to help him Build the wall. Now they didn't have the they didn't have the bricks, they didn't have the mortar, they didn't have any of that stuff, and yet he's got to convince them to help him. So he prayed first, then when he went to the king, he prayed again. Now he goes back and he's praying again. God, you help me with the people. He calls all the people together. And he says, listen, I've come back because I think we need to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. This was God's holy city. And he said, we need to build it back like God had it. And we need to build walls for protection, to protect God's people and to protect God's temple and everything in here. We need to rebuild the walls. And the people murmured. So he says to them, listen. You come here and build a temple, and we're not talking about anything great, just a place to worship. You come here and built that, and you built houses. You've done everything for yourself, but what about rebuilding the walls for God? You you, you fear. Why haven't you built the walls? 
And they would tell him, well, because there's enemy all around us and they won't let us build the walls and they threaten us and they've done this and that and the other. So we can't rebuild the walls because they're greater than we are. He said, so the truth is then that you fear man more than you fear God. And do you understand that in God's work today, the reason that God's work does not go forth like it should is because God's people fear man more than they fear God? Amen. Yeah. And I think each one of us <clears throat> could say, oh me on that one. Because I think we're probably all guilty in one way or another at some time of not doing because somebody said we couldn't or we better not or we don't have the money or we don't have this. So we back out of it. And not even, you know, it doesn't matter what God's will is. We just make up some excuse for not doing it. And probably a lot of times we'll find out we hadn't even prayed about it. We just, well, we can't do that. So he says this to them, and he begins to tell them, we need to do this because God has sent me back, and God has anointed what we're going to do, and we're going to build these walls together. So now he has to become an encourager. He has to begin to pick up the people to encourage the people, to let them know there is a way, that he's going to lead them, he's going to direct them, and God is going to minister and take care of everything around them. He says, we don't have to fear the people around us because God sent me back, and when God sent us back to do something, it's going to get done. Believe that. That's what he's saying to them. So they begin to rebuild the walls. Now, the enemy comes against them greatly. There, there are a lot of, there are seven different instances that the enemy comes against them to try to get them to stop. But Nehemiah wouldn't let them. He said, we can't stop. We got to keep going. Dwight L. Moody one time was on a ship sailing across the ocean and there was a fire that started down in the bottom of the ship. And all the men lined up and grabbed buckets, and they were dipping water and throwing the, throwing the water on the fire, and, and each, the buckets would come back around. They had a bucket brigade going, trying to put the fire out. And one of the men that was with Dwight L. Moody said to him, said, said, listen, Mr. Moody, he said, why don't we go to the front of the boat and let's be praying while they're doing this? And Moody looked at him and said, no, we're not going anywhere. He said, there comes a time where prayer and work go together. He said, give me a bucket. You see, I believe that's what the church needs to learn today. We, we can't just pray. we got to get out there and work. We pray while we work, and we work while we pray, and God's in that, and God will make something great out of that. We've got to make sure, like Nehemiah did, when he went to God to begin with, he said, God, I have sinned, and I want you to forgive me of my sins. The, pe the people have sinned, God. Forgive them of their sins. And help us to be able to do what we should. I think all of God's people need to realize that we can never be workmen for God until we are the workmanship of God. Now, do you understand that? There are too many people trying to do God's work that aren't God's children. They're, they're not prayed up. They're not where God wants them. They're not doing what God wants them to do. But yet they think they can do God's work under the pretense of being everything God wants them to be. And it won't happen because at some point you're going to be exposed. So if we're going to be workmen for God, we've got to be God's workmanship. We've got to let him remake us and remold us in his likeness and his image and make us his children so we can hear when he speaks to us. We can go when he says go. We can stop when he says stop. We can pray when he says pray. We can work when he says work. We've got to be able to hear God in everything that we're doing today if we're going to be God's people like he wants us to be. So now they're getting the walls, and the walls are going up. Seven different times in seven different ways, the enemy comes against them. Each time, Nehemiah would come to the people and he says, don't fear. Don't worry about what they're saying. Don't worry what they're doing. Don't worry about it in that God is in control. God's going to help us build this wall, and we will complete this wall. And every time he'd say that, they'd lay some more blocks. They'd get that wall going a little bit farther, a little bit farther. The enemy come against them in a greater way. They'd build some more blocks because he was encouraging them that they can do it, and God's behind it, and God will make sure it gets done. We need encouragers like that in the church. Amen. Amen. That's what the church needs. I tried to tell you that Sunday. 
We need to be encouragers. And we need not only to be encouragers of those people who are down physically, but we need to be encouragers of those people who are down spiritually. We need to pick them up and encourage them and let them know they can do it. You know, we go to little children. I go to grandchildren with things, things aren't going good and they can't get things done a lot. I want to go encourage them. I, I want to pick them up. I want them to know they can do it, that God will help them do it if they'll just trust God. And if we say that enough and help people understand that enough, they eventually will believe it and they'll begin to live and do what God wants them to do. We can only do a partial job for God when we're not fully committed to God. I wish we understood that. Only can do a partial job. And I think that the partial job that we do, is it depends entirely upon how partial our commitment is to God. In verses 18 and 20, he says, Then I told the people, the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he hath spoken unto me, and they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened in their hands, and they did it for the good work that was coming in there. And then later on, he comes back to him again. And he said, I looked and I rose up and I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the parts of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember what God said. Amen. I wonder what God said to you when you were first saved. I wonder what God told you. What did God want you to do? Maybe God didn't tell you to begin with, I want you to be a preacher. I want you to be a teacher. I want you to be this. Maybe God didn't tell you that to begin with. He had to build you up and get you to the right point. But to every one of us, God said, be not afraid. Lo, I am with you always. Don't be afraid. That's what he wants all of his people to know because we can't do anything for God until we make up our mind that we're not going to be afraid of the world. That if God says do it, it's as good as done. We've got to have that kind of faith. God, I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know where. I just know you said it. Good enough for me. If the church could get a hold of that, then we wouldn't have so much criticism in a church. We wouldn't have fighting and fussing in a church like we do. We wouldn't have that kind of mess. What would have, we would have would be a church that is in love with God, trying to pull together in unity to build up the kingdom of God and realize that all things are possible with God. All things are possible to those who believe. See, we just got to get that in the church. We've got to know individually that we first got to get our sins forgiven. And I think everybody in the church needs to have a checkup from the heart up and maybe have it every day. God, just in case, did I have a bad attitude today? Did I say something I shouldn't have said? Did I not say something I should have said? God, is there something that might be in between me and you? I don't want it there. And God, forgive me and, and make sure my heart's clean and my life is ready because I want to hear everything you say, whether you whisper it or whether you scream it. I want to do everything you want me to do, God, whether I'm physically able or not. I just want to be about your will, your business, doing your thing, and I want to please you. See, what would be wrong with having that checkup every day? Nothing. But we don't have it. And a lot of times, since we don't have it, we get down and down and down and down. And then we try to do something great, and we're down here and don't have the spirit to do it. We need to be very careful. So he encouraged them. You see, in a group of workers, even in a church, he had, he had a great number of people that was working under him. But in a church where you don't have a great number, you still have different types of people. A man that was known as the laziest man in town one day was running down a road, and he was running so hard he couldn't stop, and he ran right into another man. And he picked himself up, and the man looked at me and said, What in the world are you doing? He said, I'm in a hurry. He said, Where are you going? He said, I just heard about a job. He said, A job? He said, Yeah, and I want to be the first one there. And this is the laziest man in the town. He said, You want to be the first one there? He said, Yes. Yeah. He said, What kind of job is it? He said, It's a job for cleaning clothes for my wife. <laughs> Do 
See, there was a man running down the road, and he was running real fast. The laziest man in town, he wasn't looking for a job for himself, he was looking for a job for his wife. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I got that. That's one kind of person that there is in the world, but we got to know that there's another kind of person. In the church, you're going to have people that are always looking for something for somebody else to do. Then you're going to have that type of person who is like old Sam, old Joe Blow. He was there one day, he looked so down, so discouraged, and his friend walked up to him and said, what's the matter with you? He said, I'm just tired, man, I'm tired. He said, what are you tired from? He said, working morning to night, day after day after day after day. He said, morning to night? He said, how long have you been doing that? He said, I start tomorrow. <laughs> so you got those kind of people. They've already made up their minds it's going to be bad before they ever start. They don't want to do anything. Then you got those kind of people that want to slough it off on everybody else. They do it. They're the ones that want to sit back <clears throat> and, and watch as you do the work so they can take credit for it. They can be a part of it, but they don't want to do the work. They'd rather not. So you got to, in, you, in whatever you're doing, you got to realize everybody is not going to be involved because everybody doesn't want to work. Everybody wants to eat, but not everybody wants to cook. Everybody wants a nice place, but not everybody wants to clean up. See, I, I've learned that in my 800 years in, in, in gospel. I've learned that about people. There's always going to be those two types. But we've got to make sure. There, there, there are people that, that will do the work, and there's people that want to take credit for doing the work. All I can say to you is you forget about other people and what they're doing and what their job is, and you figure out what God wants you to do. Because God is going to hold you responsible for everything he's called you to do. Whether Sister Sue over here does her job or not does, doesn't matter. And it's really none of, none of your business. It bothers me. I don't like to be out cleaned up and watching somebody sitting down laughing. I don't like that at all. Because they could be up working, and that would make our work easier and go by a lot quicker. So I don't like that. I'd rather them go outside and laugh than sit there where I'm at so I can see them. When, yeah. So there's always going to be that, and it's always going to bother you. But you better let it go and do what you're supposed to do because that's what you're going to be responsible for, what God's called you to do. But Nehemiah had a great group of workers that he had to control. So they get the walls going. They got them almost built. And one day, and I'm talking about we're almost perfectly through, one day he gets a message. And the enemy comes to him and says, we want to have a meeting with you. And Nehemiah said, you want to have a meeting? He said, yep. There's a plane out there, the plane of Ono. And we want you to meet us in the plane of Ono for a talk. And Nehemiah said, oh, no, I won't meet you at oh, no, because I've got a great work I'm doing. That's, that's the words I read to you to begin with. I've got a great work. Come and let us meet together in some of the villages in the plain of oh, no. But. They thought to do me mischief. And he says, no, I'm doing a great work. Nehemiah understood that nothing good can come out of bad people when they're trying to stop God's work. Amen. You're always going to have it in the church. Always going to be somebody that has been Destined, they say, by God, but it's not God, it's the devil. Been called out to do a great work, and that is to criticize, find fault, and destroy. Stay focused. Nehemiah understood. And he said, oh, no, I'm not going to meet you in oh, no, because I'm doing a great work. You know what Nehemiah's great work was? Building a wall. Manual labor. Hard. 
a job that you sweated profusely on, breaking your back, destroying everything about you. It was unglamorous. It was dirty. It was nasty, hard and long. He didn't see it that way. He said, I'm doing a great work. You know why he called it a great work? Because God called him to do it. And that's what the church needs to understand. I don't care what God calls you to. When God calls you to it, it's a great work. A mother that stays home and keeps the children and doesn't get paid a penny for it and does all that nasty work and toils and labors to, 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 to support the family that way, that's a great work. Amen. To the ladies that keep the nursery up top and tend our little babies, that's a great work. To the people that go along here and, and straighten these ropes after every service where they're pulled apart and moved, they go back and fix those ropes, that's a great work. Amen. To the people that put the pencils in the pews where you take them out or take them home and throw them around, or take the envelopes and move them around. That's a great work. To the person that comes and straightens the books so God's house is pretty, that's a great work. To the choir director that prepares all the music, that's a great work. To the people that stand here and sing, that's a great work. To those who give and play, that's a great work. Those who teach Sunday school, that's a great work. Those who fill in for me when I have to be gone, that's a great work. You see, it doesn't matter whether you sweep the porch or whether you preach right here. It's a great work when God calls you to it. But the problem is that too many of us today, we get to the point that somehow or another, we divide our, parts, our lives into two parts the secular world, and the spiritual world. Or we divide this into secular and spiritual. I've got certain things I do on a secular nature and then certain things I do on a spiritual nature. And I'm here to tell you there's no difference in the two when God is involved. It doesn't matter whether you're on your job. God has work for you to do there. That's spiritual. Everything about you is spiritual. When God calls you, he anoints you. He gives you what you need to do a work. And he says, now go ye into the world and do that thing. We're always spiritual. We can't divide ourselves. I'm, what I'm doing today, I'm, I'm, I'm secular, and, you know, and I'm not having anything to do with God. This is I can do. This. No, it's all spiritual. God sees you when you're at work and when everything's going upside down and you're going nuts and pulling your hair out. God sees it and he's not pleased. You've got to realize that's a great work God's called you to. Amen. Whatever your job is, if you've prayed, whatever it is, it's a great work for God he's put you in. So whether you're doing it here, outside this somewhere, at job, at your home, wherever it is, God's in your life leading you and directing you, then whatever you're doing is a great work. How small it is has nothing to do with it. It's a great work. And one great work is not greater than another great work. Amen. Understand that. Amen. They're all the same to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says this. So therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all unto the glory of God. Amen. Nehemiah is a great example for all of us. God called him to a work. He prayed, and then he went and did it. And all the distractions and all the hindrances, he just simply looked beyond him and said, no, I'm doing this for God, and you can't hinder me. Oh, no, I'm not going to meet you. Oh, no, I'm not going to be pulled away. Oh, no, we're not going to stop building this wall because God's work is more important than anything you've got to say to me. Oh, no, I won't be distracted. We need to remember that. We need to remember it. God, I'm not going to be distracted. I'm going to be about your business. And I'm going to do it with all my heart. Now, ask yourself this question. There, there are a lot of us sitting right here in this room 
that will tell me I don't have a work to do. And I will tell you that you haven't prayed and heard from God. I will tell you that. Because there's a lot of work to be done in God's kingdom. There are things that need to be done in this church. And all we got to do is pray. Give me something to do. God, show me something I can do. And it may be pick up the trash once a week just to make the house look pretty. Blow the front porch off. Straighten this. Do that. Who knows what it might be? Ask God. But you've got to take everything you do and do it under God. Realizing the success of what you're doing depends upon you and whether or not you're willing to help God. Building a wall was a silly thing, but it was great in the eyes of God, and he picked the right man to do it. Think about it, pray about it, and then go to work. Go to work. Father, tonight I, I thank you. Nehemiah was a simple man that undertook a great task and he considered it a great work just to do anything for you. Give us that kind of a heart. Give us that kind of a mindset. Anything that we attempt to do for you is great and let us put everything we have into it to do the best that we can. Because, God, every job, every responsibility in this church has a purpose. And, God, if we don't do what we're supposed to, we're hurting the kingdom. If I don't prepare, I'm hurting the kingdom. If the music's not prepared, it's hurting the kingdom. If the sound, if the video is not prepared, it's hurting the kingdom. If we're not here, it's hurting the kingdom. Everything that you call us to do is important. And God, I pray that you'd give this church a burning desire to do your will in the greatest way possible. And to give everything we have to make sure it's done right and according to your will. And to look at it as not a job, something bad I got to do, but as a joy to get to work for God and his kingdom. The work is great. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. It needs to be carried to hospice house.